Hello there. You may be wondering why the pink suit. Well, so the world can see that I have a big ol' heart on. Whenever any source material is adapted for the big screen, there are going to be a lot of things that change. On the whole, the Deadpool movies remain more or less faithful to the comics. Well, since they retooled him for his own solo movies after that unmasked, sewn mouth travesty from the Wolverine origin movie. Wait, is that you? Striker finally figured out how to shut you up. He breaks the fourth wall, he talks to himself, he's pansexual. But as with all comic book movies, the filmmakers had to make some changes in their translation from the page to the screen. Here are the top 10 most significant differences. Welcome, Deadpool boy. Time to make the chimmy chongas. Wade Wilson was a jerk before becoming Deadpool. I'm about to do to you what Limp Bizkit did to music in the late 90s. Dad? The origin story of Deadpool is not as clear-cut as that of Superman or Spider-Man or Batman. With those guys, you know exactly how their stories began. Spider-Man accidentally led his Uncle Ben to his death and then took his with great power comes great responsibility advice on board to become New York's friendly neighborhood web-crawling superhero. I've always been a fighter. How am I in your origin story? Don't question greatness. Superman's home planet was destroyed right after his parents loaded him into a little pod and sent him to Earth, where a couple finds him and raises him on their farm, and the yellow sun gives him immense powers. But since Deadpool has been introduced and reintroduced a few times over the years, each time very differently, the filmmakers who made his first solo movie could mix and match their take on the origin story. Even so, since he's the merc with a mouth, one thing has always stayed the same, and therefore had to stay the same in the comics. What you do from there is limited only by your imagination. Before he was Deadpool, Wade Wilson was a mercenary. In the movie, when we see Wade's early days as a mercenary, he's zany and wacky and flirtatious and goofy. Vanessa. Wait, what's a nice place like you doing and a girl like this? In the comics, he was a real jerk in his mercenary days, and not in the funny way that we know him to be. He was a horrible guy. He was as bad as a villain. It could be argued that the movie did this better, since it makes Wade a likable character from the get-go. Speaking of likable, why not show us some love and click that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. Where did Deadpool get his name from? You look like an avocado had sex with an older, more disgusting avocado. Yeah. Wade Wilson's chosen superhero alter ego, Deadpool, or even his original choice, Captain Deadpool. No, just, just Deadpool. Deadpool, yeah. Is one of the coolest names of any comic book hero ever, which is only fitting since he is one of the coolest comic book heroes of all time. The name is awesome, despite the fact that he's envious of Negasonic Teenage Warhead's name and asks if they can switch. But where exactly does the name come from? Well, it all depends on whether you're going by the movies or going by the comics. In the movie, Deadpool got his name from the Deadpool, in the Hell House where the bar's customers bet on who is going to die. But in the comics, he gets it from somewhere else. He still gets it from a Deadpool, but this time it's in Ajax and Dr. Killebrew's workshop, where they bet on which of their test subjects will die. To be honest, this is better in the comics because it gives an added punch and poignancy to have the name derive from Ajax's cruelty, since the quest for revenge against him is the whole reason why Wade chooses to don a mask and become a hero anyway. Vanessa's age. Whoa, 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 baby. Are you sure you want to shoot your whole lot? The characterization of Vanessa as Wade Wilson's love interest remained more or less the same in the adaptation from comic book to movie form, but her age has changed drastically. In the movies, she's an adult, but in the comics, she's a teenager. It's understandable that this had to change. The story of a grown man falling in love with a teenager doesn't exactly bring audiences to the movie theater in droves. And from a business point of view, even with the restricted budget that Fox would give a weird, self-aware, darkly comic R-rated superhero hero movie like Deadpool, this is a summer tentpole popcorn blockbuster movie. It's not a small Woody Allen romance movie set in Europe. They want to attract as wide of an audience as possible by making Vanessa an adult, but still keeping her as the Vanessa character with the same sense of humor and the same job. So you, uh, I'm fuzzies for money? Yep. 
of childhood. She's a prostitute. The filmmakers simply made the movie more palatable than the comics. An adult man having sex with a teenager is easier to digest when it's drawn in a comic book than when it's actually portrayed in front of you by real life actors. It's still a faithful adaptation of the Vanessa character, she's just a different age, which is for the best. And Marina Baccarin, both in looks and in attitude, is perfect for the role. Wham. No, no, no. Wham. Make it big is the album that George and Andy earned the exclamation point. Deadpool got his powers from the Weapon X program. Wait. You don't have to do this. Deadpool is a classic anti-hero character because he does bad things for good reasons and has a heart of gold with a sly grin on his face. Audi 5000. Wait, wait, wait. Which is why it was such a crime that the makers of X-Men Origins Wolverine screwed the character up in such a major way. He's the merc with a mouth, and they sewed up his mouth so that he couldn't even speak, let alone make snide remarks or break the fourth wall. But there is one thing from the comics that X-Men Origins Wolverine got right, and that's the fact that Deadpool got his powers from the Weapon X program, the exact same program where Wolverine got his adamantium claws. In the first solo movie, Deadpool gets his powers from Ajax's workshop. That's his legal name. He, he got Ajax from the dish soap. Where the bad guy claims that they breed mutants and fit them with control devices to sell them on the black market as super slaves. Assuming he was telling the truth when he told that to Wade and not just messing with him. There is nary a mention of the Weapon X program, whatever. It's not a major concern. After all, what Wade does after he gets those powers is what we're all here for. Cable was the original leader of the X-Force. You are so dark! Are you sure you know from the DC Universe? The whole premise behind Deadpool 2 is that Cable, played by Josh Brolin, who also played another iconic Marvel Comics villain, Thanos, in Avengers Infinity War, is the brutal, relentless villain who came back in time from the future to kill a little kid with special supernatural powers. So Deadpool has to get together a bunch of other superheroes and form his own little team, the X-Force, to take him on. This makes Deadpool technically the first leader of the X-Force. Just walk away. Oh, so you're from the future. But in the comics, that's actually Cable, the guy who they formed to fight against in this movie. Whichever way the writers and the producers chose to set up the X-Force and its heroes in the movie's cinematic universe, which, contrary to common misconception, is not in the MCU, this is a separate cinematic universe of Marvel characters that involves the X-Men and the Fantastic Four and their related characters. It's exciting that they've now been established and they're all locked in for future movies. Rhett Reese, one of the writers of the Deadpool movies, said that after Deadpool 2, there will be both further stand alone Deadpool sequels and wider X-Force ensemble movies. I think we'll be able to take two paths, he said. X-Force is where we're launching something bigger, but then Deadpool 3 is where we're contracting and staying personal and small. So we'll get the best of both worlds. Use all of your imaginary powers to stop Cable from killing that kid. The Hell House. Yeah. He's still breathing. In the Deadpool movies, the Hell House, also known as Sister Margaret's School for Wayward Children, is a bar where all the lowly degenerates hang out, like bikers and assassins and murderers. The clientele of the bar is so dangerous that there is a running Deadpool, where people bet on which customer will be the one to die next, which Wade would later take his superhero name from. This bar is where Wade gets all of his jobs, and his friend Weasel works there as the bartender. The spirit of the Hell House is captured in the movies, but in the comics, it's not really a bar. It's more just a hangout where the local seedy criminal underbelly comes to, well, hang out. Kind of like a community center for a very dangerous community. And Weasel isn't the bartender. He's just some guy who hangs out there and sells weapons and information. Plus, the friendship of Deadpool and Weasel is totally different in the comics than it is in the movies. In the movies, they're just a pair of buddies who seem to enjoy each other's company. But in the comics, Deadpool is constantly abusing Weasel and treating him like crap. That could have been funny in the movie, but what Ryan Reynolds and TJ Miller have cultivated is fun too, and better for the plot development. A couple of characters are missing. Did you just say hollow points? Yeah, probably should have brought a super soaker. <laughs> Any 
comic book fans who saw the first Deadpool movie will certainly have noticed the omissions of a couple of characters. For starters, there was no Patch. Patch, in the comics, is the guy who tends bar at the Hell House and hands out mercenary jobs, while Wade Wilson's friend Weasel, who assumes that role in the movie, is just a guy who hangs around there. Plus, Dr. Killebrew wasn't in the movie. Dr. Killebrew is the real mad scientist who tortures Wade at the workshop that coaxes out his mutant genes. But the filmmakers had their reasons for cutting the characters. In fact, in both cases, it was basically a way of condensing and simplifying the script. Paul Wernick, one of the writers behind the two Deadpool movies, and also Zombieland, explained why Patch was gone from the movie. Weasel basically assumed Patch is behind the bar job. A lot of it had to do with consolidating and budget and making sure that we focused on fewer characters and fewer scenes. For example, Weasel became Weasel and Patch. He became the bartender. Wernick also explained the absence of Dr. Killebrew. Dr. Killebrew, basically, it was revealed at the end of the movie that Ajax wasn't the brains behind the operation. He was just a puppet to Dr. Killebrew, and Dr. Killebrew walks on screen, and you think, but ultimately, removing Dr. Killebrew was a decision of just simplification and feeling like we need one core villain and one core villain alone. So we eliminated Dr. Killebrew. Some creative choices and some budget choices ultimately dictated which characters we used and how we used them. <laughs> so someone lost his shot at Homecoming King. What have you done to me? The Cancer Diagnosis. Vanessa's already working on plan A, B, all the way through Z. In the first Deadpool movie, Vanessa comes with Wade to the doctor's office where he gets his first cancer diagnosis. And then she's desperate to help him and keep his hopes up as she gives him his medication and insists that he's not going anywhere. Bernadette is not going anywhere because you're not going anywhere. And then one night, Wade takes off and calls Ajax's lab to cure him, and a little more that he doesn't bargain for. When he escapes from the rubble of the lab and heads back into the city, Wade desperately wants to talk to Vanessa, but he feels too ugly to make his move. Still, he is never unfaithful to her. But in the comic books, Wade had left Vanessa behind long before she could find out about his cancer diagnosis. And he isn't so quick to get her back after he mutates. Instead, he sleeps around a bit and doesn't meet up with Vanessa again until she herself is a mercenary going by the name Copycat. So, the movies and the comic books have each tackled these plot points differently. It could be argued that the movie's take on it keeps the plot more grounded as a love story, while the comic's take is more true to the character. Like Beyonce says, please, please stop cheating on me. Hey! Negasonic Teenage Warhead Sexuality Chicken noodle, nothing compares to you. Sinead O'Connor, 1990, sorry. In the first Deadpool movie, Brianna Hildebrand's character, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, is a trainee who is learning the ways of the X-Men under Colossus's tutelage. By the time the sequel begins, she has graduated from being a trainee and is a full-on member of the team. Stay back or Justin Bieber dies. <laughs> Justin Bieber, he called you Justin Bieber. <laughs> Deadpool 2 also introduces us to her girlfriend. Her name is Yukio, and she's played by Shioli Kutsuna, and she's another member of the X-Men. Deadpool even tells them, you guys make a super cute couple. LGBTQ rights advocacy group GLAAD is happy about the representation in the new sequel. GLAAD president Sarah Kate Ellis said, 20th Century Fox and Marvel have finally given countless moviegoers around the world what they've longed to see. LGBTQ superheroes in a relationship who protect the world together. Together. Negasonic and Yukio's storyline is a milestone in a genre that too often renders LGBTQ people invisible and should send a message to other studios to follow this example of inclusive and smart storytelling. But the character isn't gay or bi or queer in the comics, so why the change? Why did they decide to portray the character as queer? Does it even matter? Maybe it was just to give LGBTQ people some representation in a genre that often marginalizes them. It could also be a response to Hildebrand's own personal life. In 2016, she posted a blog about her own sexual identity. At first, when she realized that she was attracted to both boys and girls, she identified as bisexual. But then she later got more confused about labels and how to identify. She concluded the post with the definitive term she uses to self-identify. I call myself queer. I could probably love a he or a she or a they. Deadpool loves chimichangas. Bigger is better, right? In the Marvel Comics universe, Chimichangas' claim to fame has always been the fact that they are Deadpool's favorite food. The Merc with a Mouth's obsession with these little Mexican delights has long been documented in the comics. It started out as an inside joke between a couple of comic book writers that was apparently about a sketch on Saturday Night Live, but it has since gone on to be one of the defining characteristics of the Deadpool character. You stay here with your weird secret sex lips. 
Okay, he has admitted that he doesn't even really like them, while he has claimed to enjoy the taste of enchiladas and tacos, and instead just likes saying the word chimichanga. Actually, it's a chimichanga. But still, it's an important part of the character in the comics, and the only mention of it in the film is one little throwaway line. Chimichangas, in case you haven't heard of them, are basically deep-fried burritos, and they're popular in Tex-Mex cuisine, and uh, they're delicious. So the character has every right to be addicted to them. But you'd think that since it makes up a large part of his characterization in the comics, they'd make more than one single tiny passing reference to it in the movie. Before you go run out to grab some Deadpool merch, hit that subscribe button and click that notification bell. And while you're here, why not check out some of our other videos?